Hello friends and welcome to my July reading wrap up where I'm going to rank and review all of the books that I read in the month of July. Last month I DNF'd one book and finished 15 for a total of 4,373 pages. The primary moods that I was reading was mysterious, emotional, adventurous and reflective. About half of what I read was medium paced, then 33% was slow and 13% was fast paced books. 60% of what I read was under 300 pages, 40% was between 3 and 500, nothing over 500 pages this month. And I'm filming against the window, so if the lighting changes, it's the sun's fault, not mine. 80% of what I read was fiction, 20% was non-fiction. And far and away, the genre that I read the most of this month was fantasy, which is a continuing trend with me. Then I read quite a bit of middle grade, young adult, science fiction, memoir, literary, historical, and some children's and LGBTQIA+, and some other stuff. I didn't read anything entirely on ebook or audiobook this month. Everything that I read was either in physical copy or a blended read of reading the physical book and listening at the same time. Now for my star ratings. Although I did definitely enjoy the majority of what I read, my average rating is quite low this month. It's only 3.33 and I think that is because I didn't find any books this month that I just fell in love with. I gave one book one star, one book two stars, five book three stars and eight books four stars. So a lot of four stars but no five star books this month and I think especially on the back of June's reading month where I found three five star books it didn't feel super great not to fall in love with anything but I still really enjoyed quite a lot so that's good. Now before we get into ranking and reviewing all of the books that I finished this month let's first talk a little bit about the book that I decided to DNF and that was The Ruin of Kings by Jen Lyons. Now I did speak quite a bit about this book in a library reading vlog which I'll leave a link to in the cards in the description box below for you. This is quite a chunky fantasy book uh, that is the first in quite a big fantasy series and I'd heard quite a bit about it from some people that I watch and love online enough that I was curious. I wasn't entirely sold but I was curious which is why I got it out from the library. However, being a very character driven reader, I did not become invested in any of the characters that I met in the first hundred pages. On top of that, I felt that the narrative choices in this were ultimately overly complex, needlessly complex, and just very convoluted. We're essentially getting one person's life story, but from two different perspectives and from two different points in time. And then on top of that, it's sort of like a story within a story, and there's like someone from this world writing footnotes for the book for us to read to make sure that we're getting everything and we're understanding everything correctly and a lot of those interjections felt unnecessary as well. So yeah I didn't like the characters, I wasn't caring for the plot and I didn't like the narrative style so I DNF'd at 94 pages. Now the book that I gave one star is actually a manga volume. This is Dawn of the Arcana Volume 1 by Ray Toma. This is a book that I picked up for 33 cents uh, at a library sale recently. They were selling three books for a dollar and this is one of the things that I picked up. I'd heard a little bit about it but not a whole lot but they had volume one so I thought I'd give it a try. And honestly this just felt super icky to me. Uh, there was a lot of like questionable consent things. There was like one particular character who was really not respectful just putting up a whole lot of red flags who was kind of being positioned as a romantic interest. On top of that the other person in the love triangle had known the girl since she was a baby. I don't know that gives me grooming red flags. Just a whole lot that was really really icky and off-putting to me. The only reason that I finished it honestly is because there's not a whole lot of text so it was a very very quick read. But I'm definitely not continuing with this series. Now the book that I gave two stars to was Pax by Sarah Pennypacker. This is another book that I got out from the library. I read in the same vlog as Ruin of Kings. And this is a children's book that we stock at work and is very popular and I genuinely thought that I would really enjoy. It's a story about a boy who has rescued a fox and he's basically brought the fox up since it was a baby and they're very very close. But then there's a war coming and the boy's father basically tells the boy that he has to abandon the fox in the woods. And so he does but then he regrets his decision and the rest of the book we spend watching this young boy try to travel across hundreds of miles of forest in the middle of a war to find a fox. And it does have quite a lot of pretty heavy handed commentary about what it is to be a good person especially in the midst of war. I would describe this as an anti-war kind of book and I can get behind that sentiment but I just didn't enjoy the way that it was done. Honestly I didn't really like the characters other than one side character who was by far the most interesting but even for a very short book it felt quite repetitive to me and ultimately it just didn't have any of the warmth or the charm that I was expecting it to have. So I found it a bit of a slog and didn't personally enjoy it. 
Now for my three star reads. Again, in that same reading vlog from the library, I also read Skunk and Badger by Amy Timberlake. This is a junior fiction title about grumpy old badger who lives in a house and one day Skunk shows up on his doorstep and Skunk is ready to move in, uh, but Badger knows nothing about why Skunk is here. And Skunk is a very carefree kind of character, whereas Badger is very like rigid and structured. So it basically is like this unlikely friendship kind of scenario that is pretty cute. I can't say I fell head over heels in love with this, but I did think it was quite charming. Then I also read Lemon by Kwon Yo Sun, translated by Jeanette Hong. This is a book that I've had on my shelf for a little while. I can't remember how I was originally introduced to this book, but I do really like the cover. It's quite a short book, and so I finally got around to it. I found it interesting enough, but I don't think that it's a book that I'm going to remember beyond this month, to be perfectly honest. It's basically told from the perspective of a girl whose sister died several years ago, and it's sort of about her long-term grief and processing. There is a mystery around the girl's death, but like this isn't a, like a whodunit or anything like that. It is much more an introspective novel, a look at what death and loss and uncertainty, I suppose, does to the people around whoever's died. There were certainly some strange things about the way that this character processed the grief and the loss, uh, but I mean grief does strange things to us I suppose. Um, but yeah, not a book that I would highly recommend, uh, but also not a book that I would dissuade you from reading, you know what I mean? I felt very neutral about it. Next up we've got Unpolished Gem by Alice Pung. This is a memoir by an Australian author who actually lives in the area that I live in Melbourne. And this was a book that my book club over on my Patreon, my Blossom Book Club read together. And it's also a book that I've had on my shelf for quite a while, so I'm glad I finally got to it. In this we learn about Alice's family and how they immigrated to Australia and then watch them as they settle in Footscray and just Alice's life from there. So it tackles a lot with different elements of identity. I really enjoyed in particular the the descriptions of Footscray and like the Saigon markets and the Footscray markets and just things that I'm very familiar with in my area. So it felt like a really cool like history glimpse into the area that I know and love so much. And although Alice has a very strong voice, she has a very particular style to her writing that you can really point out, I think, if you're familiar with it. And I do appreciate that about Alice's work. I can't say that I ever fell head over heels in love with this in the way that I was expecting to either. On top of that, I will point out that there are several uses of slurs throughout the book. There's the G word and the R word that are used multiple times. This was written in like 2006 in Australia and those words were very commonly used at the time. Still not okay and I personally found the use of them very jarring while I was reading. Then we've got Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Tien. This is a book that I actually started reading last year for a Wild Book Box vlog, which has now finally been finished and is up on my channel. I'll leave a link in the cards in the description box below for you. This is a family saga narrative that covers the period from I think about 1940 right up to pretty close to present day uh, in primarily in China but also we follow some family members who have immigrated to Canada. And there's quite a lot of characters to keep track of in this book and it's non-linear, it sort of bounces around between perspectives, between timelines, but primarily it is seg segmented into three separate sections. And those pretty much coincide with three major events in China. The first being the Great Leap Forward, the second being the Cultural Revolution, and then the third being the protests at Tiananmen Square. There's also like a story within the story, so like I said, a lot to keep track of. But I did actually find it quite interesting. I feel like I learned quite a lot about a place and time in history that I don't know a whole lot about. I gave this three stars, however, because kind of like several of the other books that I've mentioned, I never really, really sunk into connecting with any of the characters or feeling very strongly about this book. I enjoyed it well enough, uh, but I think some of the narrative choices, as well as the like overly lyrical, overly descriptive language sometimes got in the way of the emotional connection. I do feel good that I finally finished it though. Then the highest of the three stars was A Marvelous Light by Freya Mask. This is an Australian historical fantasy romance novel. And I read this in one day on our bus trip up to Batemans Bay. And I am filming a reading vlog for Batemans Bay, so I'll be talking more about that in a video coming very soon. But for now, I'll just say that this was the perfect cozy bus ride read. It was a fun and cute enough plot about this sort of secret magical world that one character who is very much not magical sort of just gets thrown in the middle of. There's a mystery and a queer romance that develops and I will say that this felt I think much more like a romance book with some fantasy elements than it did a fantasy book with some romance elements. I think primarily that comes down to like the actual structure 
of the book. Like it just hit all the beats that a romance novel does in my experience anyway. And honestly, I think I was expecting it to be the other way around. So maybe that is why I didn't like fall in love with this book in the way that I was hoping to. I did still really enjoy it. It's a very high three star rating, if that makes sense. It was cute, it was cozy, it was fun. And I am looking forward to reading book two when it comes out. Now on to my four star reads. The first one I wanted to talk about is My Friend Fox by Heidi Everett. This is the other non-fiction memoir book that I read this month and it's another Australian one, another one that we read for my book club. In this we follow Heidi as she's hospitalized for psychosis, she's diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder as well as juvenile autism and we follow her through different points in her life. We learn a little bit about her growing up and her experience sort of well, immigrating firstly to Australia from the UK and then just sort of never really feeling like she fit any, in anywhere and sort of falling in with the wrong crowd and how those really harmful relationships impacted her at a young age. And then as she gets older and her psychosis becomes more pronounced, her experience of being hospitalised, sometimes those hospitalisations are beneficial, other times they're honestly quite traumatic. Along with her lived experience, we also have interwoven this kind of parable. Um, Heidi has a very personal connection with the fox. She feels kind of like this kingship and she identifies strongly with the fox. I think especially as it exists in Australia as technically a pest. My favourite part of the book though was when Heidi adopts a dog and the relationship that the dog and Heidi develop together and they honestly they kind of heal each other and support each other through their hard times. It's such a beautiful friendship and relationship to watch blossom. And I think Own Voice's narrative of complex mental illness and experiences of the psychiatric industry are voices that we don't hear enough from. So I think this is a really important book and I'm glad I finally read it. Then All Four Quarters of the Moon by Shirley Marv. This is a book that I read recently in a new releases vlog which again I'll leave in the cards in the description box below for you. This is the story of two sisters Pei Jing and Biju who move from Singapore to Australia for their father's job and it's about their sisterly connection and in particular how much Pei Jing really feels the need to like take responsibility for her little sister. It's also about them trying to fit into not only like a new school but figuring out how to navigate a new language and a new culture. And we also watch their family do the same thing, all the while their grandmother's health is declining. So it's a really beautiful middle grade story about the difficulties navigating the fine line, that blurred line between cultures and language, trying to do the right thing by family while also honoring your own personal needs. It's a really sweet, gentle kind of middle grade. I really enjoyed it. The Wild Robot by Peter Brown is another middle grade title that I read on the bus trip up to Batemans Bay. And this was another cozy, cutesy kind of book that was perfect for the trip up. In this, we follow a robot named Roz who wakes up on an island with no humans around. She doesn't know how she got there or what's going on. She just knows that she needs to figure out how to survive. She ends up learning how to speak to the animals. She ends up adopting a baby gosling and taking care of it and becoming a goose mum, basically. It's really fun, really cute. I loved the character of Roz a lot. Then another memoir, this time it's in the form of a graphic novel. I also read this as part of my library vlog. Uh, I read Persepolis this month, finally. This is a very famous graphic novel, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. It's basically a memoir of this person's experience through the Islamic Revolution, both when they were living in Iran and then as they immigrate to France and then come back to Iran. It covers quite a long span of time and it was hugely impactful. It deals with a whole host of things from the Islamic revolution itself and how harmful that was to the rights of many, pe many people, including women, to the experience of being an Iranian in France and the racism experienced there, as well as of course, the trauma and grief of your homeland being in a state of war. Next up, we've got The Past is Read by Catherine M. Valenti. This is another book that I got out from the library. I really liked this book when I read it, but I feel like it's one of those books that I'm liking more and more as I reflect upon it. Anyway, it's this speculative sci-fi novella that is basically set a hundred years or so after the climate has collapsed here on earth. And there is no land left on earth with just a big ball of water. And the people that have survived have survived on the garbage patch in the middle of the ocean. They call it Garbage Town. And our main character, Tetley, is the most hated person on Garbage Town. And we do learn why, but Tetley is like this strangely optimistic, hopeful character that although she's experiencing a lot of awful things around her, like you just cannot help but fall in love with and root for Tetley. There's also just like some incredible and really interesting and unique world building in this novella. And it honestly just left me thinking so much about things like waste and the objects that we use and own and how most of them will outlive us and just what happens to them 
after we die. Just a really thought-provoking unique book that I honestly haven't stopped thinking about and I think I'm gonna have to buy myself a copy. And it has left me wanting to read more by Catherine M. Valenti. I just don't quite know where to start so if you have any recommendations for me please leave them in the comments below. Next we've got A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy I. Lin. This is a YA fantasy story that is essentially about the magical art of tea making. In this we follow our main character Ning after her mother has died and now her sister is dying after they've consumed a poisonous tea. Ning is not fully trained in the art of tea making but she has a very intuitive gift and so she decides to enter kind of illegally a tournament of tea makers uh, to hopefully win the favour of the princess to save her sister. There's a lot of political machinations and like a lot of political intrigue going on throughout this book that were very interesting and so it definitely has a strong sense of plot, a strong sense of pace and quite a lot of tension and high stakes as well. But there's so much description of the art of tea making, the act of tea making, what the tea smells like, like the sensual experience of drinking and making tea and the same goes for food as well. There's so much description of food uh, from a variety of different locations. And so despite the tension and the sense of pace, there's an awful lot of atmosphere and coziness to this book too. I also really love the characters, especially Ning, and I love how women-centered this book felt. I honestly can't wait for book two. I really, really enjoyed this. Then another YA. This one is fantastical. I would say it's more magical realism than outright fantasy. It's The Valley and the Flood by Rebecca Mahoney. This is another one that I'll be talking more about in my Bateman's Bay reading vlog, but suffice it to say that this I think is a really unique and quite powerful YA story about mental illness, grief and PTSD. I bought this primarily for two reasons. One, the cover. It's a gorgeous cover. But two, because it's about mental illness, I just, I knew I was either going to love or hate it. And, you know, as a bookseller, I want to be able to I don't know, have a, have a good opinion on things like that, especially when they matter to me. So I was intrigued and I'm very happy to say that I think that this is a really solid and beautiful and honest look at mental ill health, at stigma and PTSD in particular. I don't want to talk too much about the plot because this book, obviously it has a good plot, but it's not really just about the plot. Basically, our main character has PTSD. She's gone through some pretty traumatic events, including the death of her best friend a year before the book starts. And she sort of ends up drawn to this town in the middle of the Nevada desert. And her arrival has been prophesized and the people of this town believe that something is following her. Uh, they've called it the flood because they say that that's the best approximation in English that they have and that the flood is going to destroy the town. The flood is sort of this metaphorical magical realism like placeholder for her PTSD. And so we watch as our main character sort of navigates her relationship with this flood, as well as the fear both she and the people of this town have of the flood. I found this really emotional, honestly quite atmospheric and really beautiful. And I think it did an incredible job of exploring the complexities of PTSD. Like it's not always a very straightforward linear narrative, because we've got flashbacks and sort of the lines between reality, past and present sometimes get blurred. But I think that's really appropriate for a story about PTSD. I also really appreciated that this wasn't a story about being magically cured of trauma. Instead, this is a story that uses magical realism to represent big complex feelings and experiences so that we can talk about them in a healthy way. And I think it was really beautifully done. And then we've got Nira and the Immortal Palace by M.T. Khan. This is a middle fiction title that I read for my new releases vlog, which again will be in the description box below for you. This is another book that I enjoyed when I read it, but the more I think about it, the more I like it. In this story, we follow a girl named Nura who lives with her mum and her two younger siblings, and they're living in poverty. So Nura has left school to work in the mica mines. She digs all day to find mica to make enough money for her family to survive. She's quit school so that she can do this and she's sort of given up on the idea of having an education for herself but she believes that her sacrifice is worth it if her younger siblings will have opportunities that she doesn't. But then one day some stuff happens and she sort of ends up deep digging deeper than she ever has before and ends up, I don't know if she goes through a portal or she's just dug that deep, but she ends up in a magical world, the magical world of Jin. And she and her friends get taken to this massive palace that is a hotel for Jin. And obviously Jin are known as tricksters and they're not to be trusted. And it ends up being this really interesting and quite powerful uh, 
fantastical story with a lot of adventure but also commenting on some really important topics like greed and honestly there's like some proper class consciousness discussion in there as well and some I think challenges of capitalism. It's a story that encourages solidarity and I think it's really incredible. I loved in particular how Nura was not some magical child you know there's so many stories where a kid finds out that they're the chosen one or that they're actually secretly magic and I love those stories but I loved watching a very normal girl have to try and figure her way out of a magical situation and I honestly loved the commentary of this story. It does wrap up pretty well as a standalone for the first book but it is the first in a series and it's definitely a series I'm now interested in and the author is also an author that I'm interested in following too. This was great. So I think that about wraps it up. Those are the 15 books that I finished in the month of July. I hope you enjoyed watching. A big thank you to my patrons over on a Patreon and especially a big thank you goes to Livia, Lynette Brown and Marie. And thank you if you made it all the way to the end. I would love to hear in the comments below how your reading month went. Are there any books that you would particularly recommend? Let me know too if you've read any of Catherine M. Valenti's work and you would recommend where I go to next. I don't know. Chat books with me in the comments and I will talk to you again very soon. Until then, happy reading. Bye!